dragon. O Lord our God, who hast honored man with thine image divine and endowed him with reason, and who givest wisdom to those who ask, do thou thyself look down upon me, thy servant, and enlighten my mind and establish my heart to receive instruction, to be diligent in study and to achieve good success with the aid of thy divine grace. Grant that I may employ my learning unto every good work and follow thy holy and perfect will favorably unto thy good pleasure. For thou art God, thou art our God, and to do thee do we offer up glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Okay, here we go. So let me pull up the book. This book has been out of print for years. It's like a thousand dollars. So I have to read it in ebook form. So chapter one, the primitive church. Until recently, the chief documentary evidence for the first decades of the church was the Acts of the Apostles. The historical value of this canonical text is indisputable and in its second part, dealing with the mission of St. Paul, it is based on direct evidence. But the fact remains that its account covers only part of the history of primitive Christianity. The man who wrote it was a Greek writing for Greeks. He took little interest in the Christianity of Aramaic-speaking people, and he was hostile to Judeo-Christianity. It is quite clear, however, that the very earliest Christianity used the Aramaic language, and that the primitive church for long remained deeply immersed in Jewish society. Today, a number of discoveries make it possible to add to the picture of this first period of Christianity. The Dead Sea Scrolls reveal in greater detail a part of the Jewish framework in which Christianity arose and permit us to distinguish more specifically Jewish elements in the surviving Christian documents. The discoveries of Nag Hammadi, particularly that of the Gospel of Thomas, perhaps put us in touch with an Aramean tradition of the Logia of Jesus. The Judeo-Christian writings, the Didache, Ascension of Isaiah, and tradition of the Presbyters help us to re rediscover prior to, our, to or contemporary with the writings of the New Testament, an oral tradition which is the direct echo of the Judeo-Christian community. The Judeo-Christian inscriptions found by fathers Bagati and Testa on the ossuaries of Jerusalem and Nazareth show us the symbols of the original Judeo-Christian mil milieu. So today, it is, it is possible to form a more complete picture of the very earliest origins of the church. That does not imply any devaluation of the can canonical documents or their irreplaceable importance for an exact understanding of the history of the church will presently be made clear. But the new elements now available allow any partiality in the Acts account of events to be corrected. In reading the Acts, there is a danger that we may fail to appreciate how important it was for early Christianity to belong to an extremely lively, varied, and effervescent Jewish social milieu. In fact, the Judeo-Christian Church of Jerusalem played a decisive role until the fall of Jerusalem in 70. And this historical truth which is marked by the official documents, needs to be re-established. 1. Pentecost. It is as impossible to write the history of the Church without starting from the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in the year 30 as to write the history of Christ without starting from the incarnation of the Word on the day of the Annunciation. In both cases, we are dealing with events concerning the story of man's salvation, as well as with historical facts, and to envisage only their second aspect would be to misrepresent them completely. Rudolf Bultmann has clearly shown the intolerable flatness of biographies of Jesus. The same is true of histories of the church, which try to remove the divine dimension. On this point, the evidence of the Acts of the Apostles is crucial. They show the creation of the church as an event in sacred history. And there is no reason to doubt this evidence. It's, it corresponds, moreover, to the unanimous tradition of primitive Christianity. It can be treated as suspect only in the name of rationalist prejudices, which a priori reject the existence of supernatural events, except for the supernaturalism of rationalist prejudices. Anyway, that's an aside. The essential facts of the event are these. On the one hand, a mission of the Spirit, Acts 2, 4. 
the creator and sanctifier. On the other hand, the object of this mission as related to the community established by the by Christ. I just lost my place. The essential facts of the event are these. On the one hand, a mission of the spirit, the creator and sanctifier. On the other hand, the object of this mission as related to the community established by Christ during his public life. It was on the 12 gathered together that the spirit descended. And finally, the 12 were invested by the spirit with an authority and power which made them preachers and dispensers of the riches of the risen Christ. The event itself unquestionably took place, but Luke's presentation of it calls for comment. That it took place on the last day of the Feast of Weeks in the year 30 at, and at Jerusalem is historically possible. The Twelve, even if they dispersed after the Sunday following Pascha, could have returned to Jerusalem for the pilgrimage of Pentecost. Moreover, the existence of a phenomenon of glossolalia, speaking with strange tongues, seems probable. It is, in fact, found on other occasions in the life of the early community. Acts 10, verse 47 and 11, 15 and 15, and 11, 15, 1 Corinthians 14, 23, and it gave rise to scoffing. Acts 2, verse 13, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 23. Luke would have had no reason to invent it. On the contrary, as it will be seen, he tried to hide it. Let me just make sure. He tried to hide it. Peter's speech represents a primitive charismatic preaching plan. The list of peoples recalls that in Genesis 10, Above all, several features described by Luke emphasize the parallel between the revelation of Sinai and that of Pentecost. Thus, the allusion to the violent wind and the tongues of fire recalls the description which Philo gives the theophany on Sinai. See also Exodus 19, verses 16 through 19, and Hebrews 12, 18 and 22. The miracle of tongues can be linked to a rabbinical tradition concerning the revelation on Sinai. Contrary to Trachma's view, it seems probable that it is, it is Luke who interprets the glossolalia as a miracle of tongues. After Pentecost, the gospel began to be proclaimed by the apostles, notable, notably by Peter, who spoke in their midst and in their name. Chosen by Jesus during his public life, invested by him with an official mandate, they had received full powers to bear witness to the saving event of the resurrection and to discuss in God's name the conditions under which men could receive it, its effects. But it was only after Pentecost that filled with the Holy Spirit they began to exercise these powers. The circumstances of the announcement stressed the official character of their mission. Exegetes have noted the solemn character of the introduction to Peter's first speech. The second look take the second took place in the temple the third before the lawfully constituted assembly of leaders of the people of Israel. The theme of Kirigma was the resurrection of Jesus. This event was an act of God. God raised him up. This unheard of statement, the apostles justified in three ways. First, by their own evidence. They took full responsibility for it. In essence, their evidence was that they had seen the risen Christ, the appearances of the risen Christ between Easter and the Ascension here take on their full meaning. Their purpose was to establish the Apostles' faith. St. Paul was later to show that they were one of the essential points in the tradition he received from the Apostles. To have witnessed the risen Christ was the condition for being an Apostle. And as the last to whom it, the risen Christ had appeared, Paul belonged to the Twelve. It is this evidence of the Apostles which the Church will transmit. The tradition is apostolic tradition. The second proof of the resurrection of Christ was the works of the power of power 
accomplished by the apostles. So many were the wonders and signs performed by the apostles. The Acts specify the case of a par paralytic. These works of power threw the people into amazement and terror. That is to say, the Jews recognized in them the hand of God. They were performed in the name of Jesus, and by faith in him, the paralytic was cured. The miracles thus appear not, not merely as wonderful actions performed to support a statement, but also as the very efficacy of the resurrection, which was, begin, was beginning to manifest itself. They bore witness to the presence in the apostles of a divine power, and in the persons of the apostles or at their hands was virtue produced. This virtue produced divine works whereby men could recognize the presence of God and pay him glory. Finally, there remained a last proof directed particularly at the Jews, the accomplishment of the prophecies. In the case of the Jews, the problem of conversion to Christ raised a special difficulty. They did not require conversion to God. They already believed in him. They did not even need to be convinced that God would come among them. They already expected that. The only step demanded of them was to recognize in the Christ the realization of this hope, to admit that in him the prophecies concerning the end of time were accomplished. That explains considerable importance of this argument in the speeches of the Acts. It was an attempt to make the Jews recognize in the resurrection of Jesus the eschatological event announced by the prophets. Moreover, this is the meaning Peter intended. For at the beginning of this first speech, he showed that Pentecost was the pouring out of the Spirit announced by the prophets of the last days, and this expression must be taken literally. The purpose of the Kirigma, Kirigma was to make the Jews recognize that what had been accomplished in Jesus was God's work. This demanded, a this demanded first a total reversal of their attitude toward Jesus, a conversion. With this call to conversion, Peter ended his speeches. The Jews must recognize that they are that they are mistaken. They have misunderstood the divine character of Christ and condemned him as a blasphemer because he claimed that divine dignity and by so acting, they have turned from God as their ancestors did in persecuting the prophets. To recognize the divinity of Jesus is therefore to turn back to God. The resurrection has shown that what was accomplished in Jesus was divine and the be and belief in the resurrection on the evidence of the apostles, is at the same time recognition of the wrong committed in crucifying him. 2. Jewish, Jewish sects. It is important to see the primitive Christian community in the general context completed, complicated, the general context of the complicated structure of contemporary Judaism. Certain groups within this structure had been hostile to it, First and foremost, the high priests and the Sadducees, as the Acts of the Apostles attest. These two groups must not be confused. The high priests, since, since 6 AD, belonged to the house of Sethi. In 30, the head of the family was Annas, and the high priest of the office, Caiaphas. They were primarily puppets in the hands of the Romans. The Sadducees were a political and religious party devoted to the ideal of the priestly state centered on the temple. The high priests were especially jealous of their influence on the people. The Sadducees, more hostile to religious innovations. In practice, their interests were basically the same. The Acts describe three successive outbreaks of hostility on their part toward the Christian community. In the first episode, Peter and John, while preaching in the temple, were surprised by the priests. The Sadducees and the superintendent of the temple who was head of the Jewish militia used by the high priest to keep order there. Peter and John were arrested, accused before the Sanhedrin, then released. On the second occasion, all the apostles were again arrested by the temple superintendent on the orders of the high priests, and again released after the Sanhedrin had met. These two liberations proved that the hatred shown by the high priests and the Sadducees to the Christians was not shared by the other parties represented on the Sanhedrin. This is also confirmed by the Acts themselves. During the second session of the Sanhedrin, in fact, the Pharisee Gamaliel intervened on behalf of the apostles, and later, before the Sanhedrin, Paul was to profit by this opposition of the Sadducees and Pharisees. Gamaliel's speech was evidently the work of Luke, and it contains a clear historical error 
in that it alludes to the uprising of Theotis, which took place 10 years afterward. But it does, does show clearly what the Pharisees' position was. They admitted messi messianism and had no reason to condemn an a priori, a movement stemming from Jesus. The Sadducees, on the other hand, were hostile to any messianism for doctrinal reasons. The high priests were even more hostile, for they saw it in, a, in it a threat to their personal power, and that would seem to be the source of the hatred with which the house of Annas unceasingly persecuted first Jesus and later the community. A third persecution probably originated from the hostility of the house of Annas. Before Easter 41, it had claimed a victim in one of the apostles, James the brother of John, and caused Peter to be arrested. The same men were aimed at, at and the same origin may be inferred. According to Acts 12, verse 1, the initiative came from Herod Agrippa I, who, after playing an important role in the accession of the Emperor Claudius in 41, had been granted the restoration of the kingdom of Israel as a reward. We know, moreover, that he was linked with Alexander the, Al the Alabarch, brother of Philo the philosopher. On coming to the throne, he had removed the off from office the high priest Theophilus, a son of Annas, and replaced him by Simon ben Canthera, who belonged to the house of Beothos, a house which his grandfather Herod the Great had favored. But in 42, he had replaced Simon by Jonathan, and Jonathan again in 43 by his brother Matthias, both sons of Annas. This change evidently reflected a desire on Agrippa's part to gain the support of the powerful house of Annas, so that the return of this house to the functions of high priests and persecution of the Christians represent a relationship of cause and effect. Agrippa sacrificed James to the hatred of the house of Annas. As for Peter's arrest, the Acts say that the motive was Agrippa's desire to please the Jews. Moreover, it is likely that he had had little personal sympathy for the Hebrews, and he probably felt closer to the Hellenists. It should be added that the latter incident was a special interest over and above that already discussed. It is the first that we can date with complete certainty. In fact, it happened in the year before Agrippa's death at Caesarea, which the Acts record. 12, uh, Acts 12, verses 20 through 23. The incident is also recorded by Josephus, and its dating in 44 is secure. So the date of 43 for the martyrdom of James is absolutely certain. If the high priests, and particularly the house of Annas, were unswervingly hostile towards the Christians, the Pharisees' position was more complex. We have seen Gamaliel defending the Twelve. On the other hand, during the persecution of the Hellenists and Stephen, September 36th, it was they who played the chief role, Acts 6, verse 12. And it was the Pharisee Saul who approved the stoning, 7, uh, Acts 7, verse 59. This difference is significant. The Pharisees were favorable to the Hebrews and hostile to the Hellenists. It was the difference of political attitude, which in their eyes was all important. The reproach they made to the Hellenists was their detached attitude toward Jewish independence, to the temple, which was its symbol and the legal structure of Israel. Acts 6, verses 13 through 14. On the other hand, the Hebrews, though there might be converted Pharisees among them, were generally Christians attached to the, to the Jewish fatherland, faithful to the cult of the temple, and strict observers of the Mosaic practices. It was doubtless that they who formed the most important group in the first community. They won the sympathy of the Pharisees by their zeal for the law. It was to this group that the Twelve belonged. We find them loyal to the cult of the, of the temple, but their mission obliged them to be above all parties. The head of the group was James, the brother of the Lord, Galatians 1.19, not to be confused with the two apostles of that name, but it is noteworthy that the Acts scarcely mention him. It seems that Luke used traditions coming from converted Sadduc Sadducites on the one hand and Hellenists on the other, and that he left in the background what was in reality the most important part of the primitive church of Jerusalem. Luke presents Paul's view point of view, and James's party was the one with which Paul was in continual conflict. 
Galatians 2.12. Moreover, since it finally disappeared after 70, the memory of it was obliterated. obliterated. This obliteration falsifies the history of the Christian origins, for it was James' party and the Judeo-Christian Church of Jerusalem which exercised the dominant influence during the first decades of the church. Some traces of this are discernible. As regards James himself, the epistle to the Galatians makes clear his importance and attitude, and later non-canonical documents from Judeo-Christian circles throw further light. First, there is the important position which James occupies in these documents. This in itself is significant. For example, in the Gospel of the Hebrews, which appears to be linked with a Judeo-Christian community in Egypt at the beginning of the second century, it is to James that the risen Christ first appears. In the Gospel of Thomas, found at Nag Hammadi, James the Just is said to be the one to whom the apostles must go after the ascension. Clement, in the hypo, um, hypotip, the hypotyposis, uh, mentions him with J John and Peter as having received the gnosis of the risen Christ. The three apocalypses of James found at Nag Hammadi, which are Gnostic, bear witness to the Judeo-Christian sources of Gnosticism. In the pseudo-Clementine writings, which use Ebionite Judeo-Christian sources, James is presented as the most important person in the church. Hegesippus, 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 who according to Eusebius was a converted Jew, shows us James, so shows us James drinking neither wine nor intoxicating drinks, never shaving and spending his life in the temple in intercessory prayer for the people. He adds that he had the confidence of the scribes and the Pharisees. This confirms the links between James and rabbinical Judaism, which also appear in the epistle that is traditionally attributed to him. Around James clustered a number of relations of the Lord, uh, the Despocenes, who had an important place among the Hebrews. Stauffer has called the, them the Caliphate, and they formed the kernel of a powerful party. Ev evidently, they attended to corner the church, if we are to believe the Hellenists' protests, and after the dispersal of the latter, they were masters of the Church of Jerusalem. Traces of this rabbinical Christianity occur in the New Testament writings, although the latter came from the, another milieu and tend to minimize its importance. It is doubtless to this source that the whole Targumic, targumic literature must be attributed, of which traces are found in St. Paul and fragments in the Epistle of Clement, the Epistle of Barnabas, and other later works. In fact, the Targum is a t characteristic genre of the Pharisaic scribes, and parts of the Targum of Jerusalem certainly go back to the pre-Christian era. The converted scribes practiced the same literary, literary genre, but gave it a Christian orientation. Again, many moral regulations and liturgical formulas of which echoes can be seen in the Gospels, belong to the later stages of rabbinical Judaism. Finally, there remains the question of the Essenes. The facts about them are very odd. On the one hand, Christian documents show indisputable similarities between certain aspects of the Christian community of Jerusalem and characteristics of this group shown in the manuscripts of Dead Sea and references in Philo and Josephus. Some of these similarities are striking, but they do not imply the first community was an extension of the Sadducee community, for one thing, because of the lack of evidence. We do not know whether similar practices, which are attested only for Qumran, did not also exist in Judaism. Certainly, there existed uh, chabara or confraternities, where the sharing of property and communal, communal meals may ha well have taken place, and, these, and this seems the most probable explanation of the similarities. Moreover, it is beyond dispute that the Christian community shared the eschatological hopes found in the apocalyptic writings which came from the Sadducee circles. But it does not follow that the Christian community recruited its members among the Sadducees. We know from Philo that the Essenes were a small group like the Pharisees and Sadducees. Most of the Jewish people did not belong to these groups, but they felt their influence. In this respect, it is certain that the Sadducee influence extended far beyond the small number of its members. All the more, since their literary production was intensive, their influence certainly prepared people's minds to accept Christ, and it is probable that 
it was in circles influenced by them where eschatological hopes were highest that many were converted to Jesus. It remains quite possible that there were some Essenes in this strict sense among the first converts to Christianity. Perhaps the Essene traits noticeable in the picture of the first community in Acts come from Luke's use of a document belonging to a Christian group of Sadducee origin. In some respects, this picture recalls the one given of the Essene community by Philo a little earlier. The resemblance is so striking that Eusebius of Caesarea thought that Philo's description referred to the primitive Christian community. This may also explain other features of the first chapters of Acts. For example, the way Pentecost is described, we have seen that Luke was concerned to suggest a parallel with the revelation on Sinai, but we also know that for the Sadducees, the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost is the Feast of the Revelation and the Covenant. The Book of the Jubilees in particular bears this out, and that the last Sunday of the Feast of the Theophany of Sinai was especially commemorated. It has also been pointed out that by their choice of quotations, Deuteronomy 10, verse 16, 18, verses 15 through 19, um, etc. And in their method of exegesis, the speeches in the first chapters of Luke's of Luke show a special connection with the manuscripts of, the, of Qumran. These speeches belonged to the document used by Luke, and so doubtless reflect a catechesis of Sadducee complexion. Then there is the further question of whether in the text of the Acts there are more precise allusions to converts from Essen Essenism in the first community. This problem is a strange one. On the one hand, the first Christians seem to present the greatest affinity with the Essenes. Yet at the same time, the Essenes are the only one of the three great historic sects not to be mentioned in the New Testament. O. Coleman has suggested that the Hellenists mentioned in chapter 6 of Acts may be Essenes. It must be admitted that the Hellenists are difficult to identify. H.J. Shupps sees in them the projection by Luke onto the Church of Jerusalem, a situation which only existed later than 70. Uh, Gator and um, F. Trochtma identified them as Palestinian Jews speaking Greek, M. Simon as Jews of the Diaspora. In reality, the group seems to have been composite. According to Acts, its members were completely Palestinian. According to Acts, its members were partly Palestinian Jews, like Stephen or Philip, th whose Greek names show that they were Hellenized, or they could belong to the circle of the, of, of the Herods, like Manathan, foster brother of Herod the Tetrarch. Some could come from the diaspora, like Barnabas, a native of Cyprus. Then there were also proselytes, that is to say, pagans converted to Judaism, like those in Acts 2 and verse 11. And Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, expressly mentioned in, as a Hellenist, Acts 6, verse 5. It is not impossible that some Essenes were, who were separated by their succession from official Judaism belonged to this group, for they would be drawn to it by their hostility to official Jewish circles and their, context was hel on, and their contacts with Hellenism. 3. The life of the community. While describing the environment in which the Jerusalem community developed, the Acts reveal something of its life. The first Christians continued to share in the religious life of their people. Thousands of Jews have learned to believe, and they are zealous supporters of the law. This means that the children were circumcised, rules of ritual purification observed, and the Sabbath kept as a day of rest. In particular, the Christians of Jerusalem took part in the prayers which were recited daily in the temple. Acts 2 verse 46. Peter and John went there for morning prayer, 521, and for prayer at the ninth hour, 31. So Christians appeared to others as specially fervent Jews, whom the blessing of God accompanied. Acts 5 verse 13. They did, however, all go to the temple. Acts 2 verse 46. And so they formed a special group within the body of Israel. The Jews themselves were well aware that they constituted a special community. The Acts already refer to them as Ecclesia. 
which in Greek means an official assembly. But it would seem that its meaning in Acts refers back to its use in the Greek translation of the Bible, where it means the people of God assembled in the desert. Henceforth, the word signifies that the Christians considered themselves not only as one community among others, but as the new people of God. The word Greek, I can't read Greek, was first applied to the church of Jerusalem. Maybe it's Christian. Later, it was applied to the various local churches, which were founded on the model of the mother church. For example, Paul, maybe it's Ecclesia, I'm not sure. Paul gathered together the church of Antioch and greeted the church of Caesarea. The concrete character of the church clearly appears in these passages. But Christians were also aware that it was one and the same church which was present in the different places, and the word took on the meaning of universal church. At the same time as they shared in the life of their people, the Christians had their own life. They met together. These meetings took place in private houses, as in the upper room, where they were the very first community gathered. Later, there were many such meeting places, and the Acts say that the Christians broke bread in their houses. One of these houses is known to be that of Mary, mother of John Mark, where quite a numerous group gathered and prayed while Peter was in prison. 1212. Again, we find that Paul exhorted the brethren in the house of Lyd uh, Lydia the in Philippi, 1640 and it celebrated the Eucharist on the third floor of a private house in Troas. 29. The upper room, usually larger and not lived in, was well suited to these lay meetings, and families got, gave their support to the church in this way, by placing their houses at the disposal of the community. Paul speaks of Aquila and Priscilla, and of the church which is in their house. 1 Corinthians 16.19 in these Christ these Christian gatherings were frequent. The Acts tell of daily meetings, including the breaking of bread, a meal, and prayers of praise. And some of them were held at night, the, as, as when Paul found a large gathering at prayer in the house of Mary, mother of John Mark. One thing seems certain, that a meeting was held on Saturday night, as recorded in Acts. On the Sabbath, the Christians took part in, a commu in communal prayers and gathered together afterward. And it would seem that this custom led to calling Sunday the eighth day. For this expression, which is found as early as the epistle of, pseudo -bar of, of the pseudo-Barnabas, can only be explained in terms of the seventh day of the Jewish week. The usual expression was uh, Kyriake, the Lord's Day which corresponds to our Sunday. It is not certain, however, that Christian meetings were always held at night, and it is quite possible that they were also held at other times. That is also notably what, when the Eucharist accompanied a meal, as described in the first epistle to the Corinthians, 11 verse, uh, verse, um, verses 17 through 33. From what the Acts tell us, it is possible to form a picture of these meetings. They included instruction, breaking of bread, and prayers. Although the Acts provide plentiful examples of preaching to unbelievers, kirigma, they are silent about the teaching given to the community. But we can form some idea of, from the expressions used to describe it. Sometimes there is instruction in the strict sense, didache, but that word is usually used primarily of the catechesis before baptism. And at ordinary meetings, there were usually exhortation, paraclesis, paraclesis, in order to strengthen faith and charity, or homilies, and discourses of a more intimate kind. The epistles of Paul and the other canon canonical epistles give an idea of these discourses and exhortations, which they themselves largely echo. Instruction was followed by the breaking of bread. That is the archaic phrase used in Acts to describe the Eucharist. It recalls Christ's gest gesture when sharing the bread after having pronounced the words of consecration over it. Christ had instituted the Eucharist during a Paschal meal. The blessing of the bread is that of the azymes, unleavened elements, before the meal. The blessing of the wine corresponds to the cup which followed the meal. 
These are the two rites which the Christians kept, separating them, however, from the Paschal meal and performing them either at the end of the meal or without any meal. The person who presided over the Eucharist, having given thanks, blessed the bread and wine by stretching his hands over them and pronounced the words of Jesus at the Last Supper. The prayer of blessings, blessing and the outspread hands correspond to what is found in the Jewish Baraka of the manuscripts of Qumran. The Eucharist was followed by prayers, according to the Acts, and these prayers were said principally by the apostles or elders who presided over the meeting. But members of the meeting who had received the appropriate grace could also say prayers, as, for example, the prophets of the community of Antioch and the prophet Agabus. In, this, in his first letter to the Corinthians, St. Paul speaks of these prophets. As for women, they were excluded from instruction but were allowed to take part in the thanksgiving. And St. Paul says that they must have their heads veiled. The deacon Philip had four daughters who prophesied. It is noteworthy that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit took place chiefly during the Christian meeting, which was the new testament which was the new temple where God dwelt, and which rendered the old temple useless, although it was still in existence. Another feature of life in Jer the Jerusalem community, the one on which the Acts lay most stress, was its economic organization. The Acts speak of the brethren pooling all they possessed. They sold their possessions and their means of livelihood so as to distribute to all as each had need. The Acts mention in particular the case of Barnabas, who, possessing a field, sold it and gave the proceeds to the apostles. On the other hand, Ananias and Sapphira, having sold a field, kept back part of the proceeds and deceived the apostles. The passage states that the, this pooling of resources was not obligatory. Sapphira's sin was that she lied to the community. It is difficult to know exactly what this pooling of resources amounted to. It may have been a communion cash box to help the needy, like the one in the synagogue. We know that Christian widows administered such relief daily. But Luke seems to mean something more than that, a true pooling of resources. It seems less astonishing today, now that it has been discovered that this custom existed among the Sadducites. Sadducites. The Essene flavor of Luke's narrative has already been mentioned, and its description may possibly have been influenced by practices in the community of Qumran. But the episode of Ananias and Sapphira, or Ana yeah, Ananias and Sapphira, recalls the discipline of Qumran so closely that it would seem to be an example of an effective influence of Essene practices on the Jer Jerusalem community. These problems of economic organization are treated in the Acts in relation to another matter as well. The Acts record that as a result of protests from the Hellenists, who, were, who complained that their widows were neglected, the apostles chose from among them several seven persons who included Stephen. We have seen that the Christians had already instituted relief for the poor, modeled on that in the synagogue. This had been in large in charge. This had been in charge of the apostles, who now handed in the charge of the apostles, who now handed it over to the seven. But the seven were not intended solely to take charge of the poor relief of poor relief. They were they also preached and baptized. In fact, the apostles took advantage of this opportunity to provide themselves with fellow workers. They communicated part of their powers to them, and this was done by ordination. Acts 6.6 6. The question then arises, did this institution apply only to the Hellenists? When the apostles felt the need of fellow workers, ought they not to have done likewise for the Hebrews, as Geister says? Luke's silence. Yeah, Luke's silence may be explained by the lack of interest he shows in the Hebrews. Colson seems nearer the truth when he says the seven, and when he sees in the seven an institution special to the Hellenists. The Hebrews already had presbyters or elders, and James the just was certainly one of them. And Acts shows us how the Christians of Antioch entrusted offerings for the poor to the elders, um, presbyteroi, presbyteroi of Jerusalem, 1130. Among the Hebrews, these elders performed the functions which the seven performed among the Hellenists. 
Another important point is the preeminent position which James the Just held among the presbyters. He seems to be credited with a fuller share in the apostolic powers. When Paul came to Jerusalem in 41, he met, he met Peter and, and this same James. And at the Council of Jerusalem, James was the only one to speak with Peter. So James was then certainly held head of the Jerusalem community. Moreover, he seems to have possessed powers like those of the apostles. It is in this sense that Eusebius is to be understood when he writes that Peter, James, and John did not reserve the direction of the local church of Jerusalem for themselves, but chose James the just as episcopus or bishop. Or bishop. Henceforward, he, not Peter and the apostles, was responsible for the local church of Jerusalem. He was both present president of the local college of presbyters, and heir to the apostolic powers. In this way, the church of Jerusalem assumed its own special structure. The apostles were the witnesses of the resurrection and the trustees of the fullness of power, and Peter appeared as their head. At the beginning, they directly presided over and administered the church of Jerusalem, but they took associates to work with them. At first, there were the presbyters who looked after the, the Hebrews, they formed a college with James as the president, and James shared in the apostolic powers to a special degree. The apostles were in also instituted a similar organization for the, uh, for the Hellenists, in which the seven corresponded to the Hebrew presbyters, though it is difficult to know whether Stephen was their equivalent of James. In any case, the departure of the Hellenists was to make the college of presbyters the sole hierarchy in Jerusalem.